Um, the one thing of note, we felt like the neighborhoods were really, the residential neighborhoods were very stable. Um, you have a nice diversity of housing stock. You definitely have a good housing stock for um, young families, empty nesters. Um, and your demographics are actually showing that both of those types of folks are living in Peru. Um, and then one downside we saw to your current land use development is that a lot of your commercial is in pockets. It's not all in one core area. So that walkability to different commercial sites in town is not as cohesive as you'd like it. It's more scattered, bare swamp road, portions of Main Street, then there's skips to a lot of residential. The upside to all of that residential on your Main Street is that you don't have a lot of empty storefronts, which can really make a downtown look not, no longer functioning. So that's sort of the upside to having a lot of residential. But we did, we did feel like everything was in fairly good condition, and, and it was, it's a pretty nice Hamlet land use um, uh, mix with the aside of the commercial being a little scattered. One of your biggest assets we felt were all the community amenities that are within a walking distance in your Hamlet. Um, having the school campus in a walkable neighborhood setting like this is unusual and um, a real, you have a, a really nice asset here in that. The trail, uh, even Sullivan Park is technically within walking distance of many residents. So you have a couple of parks, you have Hayward Mason Park, um, and churches, uh, etc. all town hall, the library, all within a walking distance, half mile radius is what you'd like to see. So you have all of those things now. And then, of course, one of our main focuses was your infrastructure and how everything's functioning. Um, we felt your existing sidewalk system is in fairly good shape. We also think you have a fairly extensive sidewalk system for upstate villages and hamlets. <coughs> you actually have more sidewalk than a lot of the communities we've worked in, so we thought that was a real plus. Um, looking at how things are functioning now, you seem to have adequate parking for the businesses you do have. It would be better to have a problem of not enough parking because you have more businesses, but at the moment it seems like there's an adequacy there uh, in terms of on-street parking or the private parking lots and, and town parking lots uh, for town uses. Um, you know about your own uh, water and sewer, but your capacity right now does it is there, uh, especially with the future sewer line improvements planned. Some communities are struggling with that. They don't have the water, or they have the water and not the sewer. And so new development is a problem. Um, and even expansion within their own footprint. So you have both of those things in place, which we felt was good for community revitalization. Um, one of the biggest things we, we did feel was a, was a negative is all the excess pavement and road width that you have on 22 and 22B. Um, that creates high speeds because there's, there's all that pavement doesn't slow you down. Uh, and it doesn't create a safe environment for pedestrians, even though you do have a sidewalk to walk on. It doesn't feel as safe when people are whizzing by you. Um, so we did, and uh, suffice of us, obviously, have the same issue. High rates of speed is not safe for bike, bike or pedestrian. So we definitely felt that was an area for improvement. And I think the community identified that before we even came on board, so that probably is not news. We did identify one location where um, Sidewalks don't exist, and that would be in the uh, at the um, and there, there was lacking an east-west connection, like to the school campus, and then to, more towards Main Street on the north end of the hamlet. So something like Holden Avenue would be a good place to, to run an existing sidewalk connection uh, to really round out that east-west connectivity that you have. Uh, and then another thing that you know definitely we're seeing communities you know potentially do more with that you could you could really use is more beautific beautification on this on the streetscape, more more elements to just make you feel like you've arrived in a in a neat, interesting place, something that more identifies your community. Um, you have the walkability elements, you just don't quite have all the feel. So adding planters and those types of things, even if it's banners or something simple like that, just some more of those elements would really um, some public art can really make a place feel different. Um, we identified some unsafe intersections, also some of the same intersections that uh, the business survey had identified, but the Stewart's intersection, the intersection uh, at Pleasant Street, um, that's, a, that's a funky intersection, 
uh, and then the crossing at the Tops Plaza. Um, people trying to cross, you know, when you have to jump sidewalks at that point, that is not a great, that is not a great crossing. Actually, that picture right up there is uh, there. That's definitely an unsafe situation. I actually watched a grandmother and daughter negotiating that one day, and I'm sure they do it all the time, but it wasn't great. Uh, and then signage. Um, gateway treatments, as you're arriving into the hamlet, makes you feel like you've arrived somewhere. It's a simple, fairly low-cost way to sort of present a um, more feel to the community. And if you need wayfinding signage, um, just to identify some of your key assets for people that may be coming in from out of town or visiting, or even your own residents. I think some people weren't even aware so much about Hayward Mason Park, so just some of those types of things. <coughs> and one of the last things we looked at was how does your zoning work? How does your land management look, uh, work now? Because sometimes communities have a lot of other elements, but if they're not, and they're wondering why they're not getting development, well, sometimes your zoning can be a little out of whack with what you want to do. Um, you did update your zoning in 2014 after you did your comprehensive plan. And our review of the zoning, actually, we felt like your zoning pretty much fits what you're trying to do here. You want a mixed-use downtown, you want to allow commercial development, um, you want to encourage reuse of structures. So we didn't feel like there was anything there that was holding you back, and we that that was pretty well done. And you do have some design guidelines in place, which I think are really important to maintain community character, uh, requiring sidewalk connections, making sure if there's infill development that it sort of is in keeping with what you have now to keep that, that street wall, to keep the, the connectivity of the existing structures. Um, because one really poorly done building, or modern building in the middle of an of a otherwise historic Main Street field can really throw off the, the whole look. So I think that the design guidelines you have in place to just sort of keep that in perspective is, uh, is helpful for planning boards and zoning boards as they're considering projects. So after looking at all of that stuff, we went back to the committee with our report on that, and then we established, after brainstorming projects, we did a field, we did a field tour with the committee. We came up with a set of goals and then projects from those goals. Uh, as part of this plan. And so we had five main goals. Improve pedestrian and bicycle safety, slow tra <laughs> traffic speeds on Main Street, routes 22 and 22B, increase pedestrian and bicycle connectivity to Main Street and other community resources and amenities, enhance Main Street and reestablish the town center through placemaking enhancements to foster more economic and community activity, and finally support private sector investment in properties and businesses on Main Street. So some of it's programmatic, some of it's bricks and mortar, but all of it needs to work together to have, <coughs> to have a revitalized community. And when we were picking projects and actions, we actually um, had a couple of key considerations. Um, a plan is only as, as good as the, the thought process of what's doable. Um, so we did identify short and long-term enhancements. Uh, Short-term enhancements can sometimes be the low-hanging fruit. There's a project in hand, let's run with it. Um, sometimes projects may be a really important idea, but they're complex. They take a lot to pull together. And so you want those on your, in your plan because they're eligible for funding then, and they're also something for the, for the town board to keep in mind as you're you know, moving through time and things come to the surface. But they may be more wish list. They may be not quite doable tomorrow. So we looked at that, and then we also looked at the feasibility. Some projects are very complex, take a lot of permitting, uh, and site control issues may be there. So you look at that, what's really doable, cost, you know, is there, are there grants for that type of thing, or is it really going to require out-of-pocket expenses by the town, or, or you know, is it a, really a private privately owned property where you're really waiting for private investment to just take place when, when the property owner can do it. And then finally, the magnitude of the benefit. Is it impacting enough people to make the project worth it? Who benefits from that and how, you know, and, and how many people can, can really see the impact? And then lastly, 
knowing about the sewer line upgrade when you're talking about streetscape improvements, you want to keep that in mind because you don't want to rip up a street twice, right? So, and just in thinking about everything, you're constantly kind of keeping your sewer project in mind. I'm going to run through a couple of our um, key areas of recommendation that were more programmatic and a little less uh, streetscape specific, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ian. So our first group of projects and recommendations had to do with placemaking enhancements to foster more economic and community activity. Um, so we would suggest, and this is what a lot of communities are starting to do, because they, A, it's economical, B, it brings the communities together and it brings key, key partners into a community, is to, local, to collaborate with local artists, um, to install public art at gateways. Um, your bridge right now just functions as a bridge, but that really could with a little place place making elements, even just some some baskets at the at the, <coughs> at the beginning of it, or a few other elements along that bridge. It's at your river. It's the hub of your central downtown area, and that bridge could actually function much more as a gateway than it does right now, which is basically just you don't even know you're passing over the, into the hamlet, really, into the downtown. Um, Improving gateways, I mentioned it earlier, but those can be pretty cheap ways of just making you feel like you've um, arrived somewhere. Uh, a little sculpture, local art, um, gateway signage, just welcoming you to town. You do have signs now. Um, providing streetscaping elements like flowering baskets, improving signage, and more events. You do have a fair amount of events. I don't think you necessarily lack events here. Um, but those are really important in keeping those going. Even farmers markets, things like that, just reasons to congregate and get people to gather. It creates a lot more community than when you, you don't have those things. And I, I live in a community that has very little, and it used to exist, and everybody misses it. So be glad that you have music in the summer and things like that, because that does make a community. Another area was looking at uh, key sites and private investment in, in certain um, properties. Uh, we did identify about five or six, maybe six sites around the Hamlet area on, along Main Street um, that are underutilized, uh, vacant for a while, that are kind of key sites that, um, you know, communities can get grant money or, or <coughs> financing through programs through the state to try to move projects through or get buildings redeveloped, and that's something to keep in mind um, because over time, if you can do a partnership with, a, with a, a key site, it can really make a difference, and you have a few of those. Not too many, but you do have a couple. Um, so one, one obvious building is your Hayworth Mason building. Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful site. It's a really cool building. Obviously, it would take some doing to adaptively reuse that, but that could really be a, an interesting project of getting somebody into that building. Um, for any, any number of uses. Um, and then in doing that, you would support infill redevelopment, adaptive reuse through, um, you can do, there's some tax incentives that the town could locally adopt. Um, there's small business development programs. You can partner with the county. You can partner with the college, colleges. And you can also just get your own uh, small business grant fund to help businesses who want to maybe do some expansion. So those are things to keep in mind if you're looking for ways to help some of your local uh, local commercial uh, storefronts, and, um, and they don't have to be retail, it's an all-encompassing all type of commercial business uh, programs. And I looked at your zoning. I think it's in pretty good shape, but always keep, keep in mind you want to make the right project easy. So if you're finding that you're not able to say yes to a project you really want, probably should relook at your zoning a little bit to make sure you're, you're getting it right. Um, another option is to, um, uh, this, there's this new sort of, well, it's almost like a co-op, but, but not really. These, these things are called Main Street LLCs where private citizens are partnering together to buy buildings. Um, and then they can write off a bunch of the improvements to the buildings, and maybe one of those folks moves into the building and runs an office, but it, and then the collaborative effort to get that building back on the tax rolls and back to productive use is good for the community, and they can actually realize their uh, return on <coughs> investment 
through renters or their own use of structures, but it's becoming a, a more popular uh, tool in upstate New York where it's just impossible for small communities to, to get that level of investment without some of these unique uh, unique ideas. So if you do find that a couple people want to buy a building and maybe put, a, put something into it, I would encourage you as a community to, to help them with that. And then lastly, work with your regional and county folks um, on, on things like trying to encourage a land bank, which is a way to um, take properties and buildings that are um, up for auction, get them off those auction blocks, get them into a sort of a, it's, well, it's a land bank, but it's like they bank the buildings and the properties and then reinvest in those properties and then put them back out for sale with improvements, with demolition done, et cetera. And that can help small communities that can't otherwise afford to do um, to do those kind of um, adaptive reuse or demolition on their own, I would highly encourage Clinton County and um, the region to try to get a regional land bank. So if you, if you hear about things like that as a community, it's something that you might really be able to benefit from. And lastly, marketing. You do have tourism assets here in the hamlet, but also in the town as a whole, obviously, you have Lake Champlain. Um, taking more advantage of that, when you do have visitors come to the, to the waterfront, trying to get them into downtown here. Um, I know you need to have the amenities to draw them in. It's a chicken and egg thing, but you have to start somewhere. So marketing the, you know, marketing the community at the campground and state parks. Um, cyclists. Cycling is huge and growing, and Route 9 is a major route for cyclists. So, you know, attracting those cyclists off of Route 9 into the hamlet, just even to eat, they spend a lot of money. Um, so, I, that's, a, I think, an area where you could really probably get some more traffic in downtown. Supporting agritourism and agribusiness, um, they, you know, building on your local orchards, distilleries, cider mills, everything like that is a booming business in upstate New York. And there's a lot of money um, being invested by the state into businesses of that nature, so um, it's definitely a good time to be getting into that business. So I would encourage the town to, um, you know, to keep their, keep their ears for, uh, you know, listening for possible businesses of, of that nature and sites where they could maybe open a, uh, you know, a storefront or, you know, a lot of tasting room, things like that. They're also on the Champlain Valley International Wine Trail. So, you know, over time you might see traffic pick up on that. And that's another opportunity to take a regional idea and market your local community. Other regional ideas that Peru should definitely make sure that they're doing what they can to promote Peru. Uh, you're part of the Adirondack Coast, whether you know it or not. Um, so that's a regional marketing strategy for this area. Um, Peru should absolutely make sure they take advantage of that. And you're also part of the Lake Locks Passage, which is a scenic byway. Um, it's one of the more well-known scenic byways in New York State, and they're very active. Um, and that's another place where the town could market, market the community. Um, using regional websites, everything already exists. You just need to keep feeding them the material to really promote the community. So, and I think that is, yes, so from here, we turn it over to some of the more streetscape element portions of the plan. So that was more the programmatic side. I asked you to keep it short. I guess we skipped to one slide that I thought was sort of important that we okay. were discussing. And that was just, we were talking about the concentration of, I think you were referring to roofs at one point, just that you... The number of rooftops? Yeah, you yes. thought the hamlet was actually uh, pretty good for being able to support small businesses, unlike some other upstate. Do you think we have another we, we one? Pick, yeah, well, we we had, that was kind of a double slide. We had yeah. kind of in the front and the back, so I'm going to touch on that too. Yeah, you will touch on Actually, I think it might be the next slide. Okay. Or it's very close here, yeah. And that even speaks to the land, the whole land use inter, can, you know, interaction that you have. You have a lot of feet able to get to downtown very quickly to shop uh, and, and do business uh, and just entertain. So in the, world of, in the world of planning, these are the types of things you look for as a positive in a community. And, and a lot of communities don't have that. And I'll let Ian talk about that a little bit more. But, um, so I'm going to turn it over to him at this point. So 
Uh, so Monica talked a lot about some of the big general ideas. I'm going to focus in on kind of the key areas um, of the project where we did site-specific um, conceptual design and then, and then ultimately one of the projects, the priority project that we actually took through construction drawings and <coughs> has the potential to be able to go out to bid here in the short term. So we had three primary uh, design areas that are indicated uh, in that shaded green. Um, North Main Street, you know, right outside the door here. Um, the intersection of 22 and Maiden Lane by, by Stewart's there, that fun intersection that everyone loves uh, to talk about so much because it, it justifies that conversation because it's, it's not safe and it's very difficult um, both for the ambiguity for vehicles but also for, on, on pedestrians and the overall connectivity of the hammer. And then uh, lastly, the other area of focus was um, closer to the bridge and the Pleasant Street intersection, which we were kind of referring to as the hub of the hamlet. Um, it's the natural <coughs> spot um, that is most conducive to being a true hamlet center. Uh, so we're going to get into some of those reasons. And then also talk about kind of the overall, uh, a little bit of a deeper dive on the overall connectivity to both your recreational assets and to the school um, and, and overall connectivity throughout the hamlet. So we'll start um, on the, the North Main Street area. Um, kind of broke this into both short-term and long-term considerations. The real big picture idea out here on, on North Main Street is in our opinion, and I think this got confirmed through the, the public process, is I would consider it significantly overpaved. Uh, I, I would be willing to bet that historically um, there was a grass strip on both sides. There's, there's evidence of it that still exists out there today. But at some point in your history, um, probably Dutch elm disease or something, the trees came down and and decided to pave that strip. Well, that's a big reason why folks drive so fast. And even though you do have tremendous sidewalk infrastructure throughout your hamlet, that really um, not only erodes the walkability, like the, the feeling um, of feeling good when you're walking, that incentivizes people to walk because uh, of that traffic speed, but it also kind of erodes Kind of the sense of place and the aesthetic quality. You have really nice housing stock in your hamlet, but because of that over pavement, it weakens that a little bit. You know, it, it, it's lowering that aesthetic quality um, with the hamlet just simply because you're, you're literally paved. There's no separation between the vehicular realm and the public realm. You're paved right up to your sidewalks. Um, the biggest impact on that is just driver speeds. There's no areas for street trees. It's completely wide open. Speed limits do almost nothing to control how fast people drive. People drive as fast as they feel comfortable. So when they feel like it's completely wide open and they can see everything they need to see, they're going to go fast. And you know, you're know you entering in the hamlet here. We should be doing the opposite. We should be getting, getting people to slow down and have them transitioning into a, a center. This is where it, the pedestrian needs to take more of a priority, and so therefore we need to, pro, uh, to, to slow things down. So simply by giving back, taking back that excess pavement, still leaving room for on-street parking. So typical drive lane widths, on-street parking widths, but then you have this excess area that ranges from say four to eight feet um, that right now is, is paved. And so sometimes you literally see people parked all the way almost to the sidewalk. Um, and again, um, when, when there would be an opportunity to kind of green it up um, from a stormwater standpoint, it'll slow the stormwater down. Right now, everything that's just kind of a paved swale, so uh, it, it's making its way um, to wherever the outfall is very fast, so th this will improve that and the street trees will help to tighten up that, that road profile and, and slow people down. The other thing that it does is it improves your crossing. So whether crossing over from the church over toward the town hall site or by the library, um, 
because we've shortened that distance, it makes it much easier, particularly for our seniors and walking with children, um, to shorten that crossing distance. Um, so that's some of the things that we're hoping that, that we've segued into. We're going to get into a little bit more, but that was selected as the priority project. So we've moved that. It, so it's a fairly simple project: just saw cutting, removing the pavement, putting back dirt where appropriate, planting some street trees, um, reinforce the side or widen the sidewalk areas in front of the library and out in front of this building because a lot of people will park right there and be able to go in and out quickly. Um, so very simple but and link to the trail and pro provide a contiguous loop. Loops are really important with trail systems. Um, they encourage that their, their usage goes dramatically up. But what's really important for you is the impact that that would have on bringing people potentially to your, your center, to your hub. So the ability to have such a tremendous recreational asset that also could lead to spin-off economics, that's when you're hitting a home run and why that connectivity is so important. So not only providing an opportunity to link the neighborhoods to that system, but then the, from, from that system to your recreational asset is the big idea. So that's just a little sketch of how that future path uh, could look. Still have plenty of room for the on-street parking. Nice landscape strip with the with uh, the opportunity for street trees. Street trees not only are important to slow down the traffic, but they also make the the pedestrian feel more comfortable. We call that defensible space. So when you have trees between you and the and the road, um, it makes you feel more comfortable. You feel a separation there. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to utilize your sidewalks and have it be much safer. Other examples of how these systems work in communities, you know, not all over New York State, but all across the country. So a little idea of how, again, how overpaved you are. So you can see there's an on-street, your, your typical lane width, and then how much excessive space you have in your shoulder right up to the sidewalk area. Um, so there's the library and then this would provide an opportunity there to, uh, to be able to pull it right in front of the library um, but add some landscape opportunity on each side and kind of soften that, that edge up. The way the planting is proposed, because um, your, your overhead wires switch sides about halfway down North Main Street, so wherever you don't have uh, wires overhead, we propose bigger shade trees. And where you have wires, we propose the appropriate scale trees that would fit under the wires so it don't become a long-term maintenance problem. So now we're going to get into uh, the intersection. Um, of 22 and, and Maiden Lane. Um, how many of you have had trouble negotiating that intersection, you know, walking and trying to cross? So we've been out there uh, different times of the day, different times of the year. Um, essentially, that's the same problem. It's overpaved. Um, the, the, the road geometries, the way that white line is striped, it allows cars, trucks, and, and tractor trailers to take that turn at excessively high speeds. So the proposal is very simple um, to basically take back any excessive pavement, um, curb the white line to make people honor, to make people honor it, um, and shorten the pedestrian crossing. So make make sure all the trucks can make their turn safely but just at a much slower speed. Um, it'll improve it aesthetically uh, as well as functionally. Right now it's so wide and ambiguous um, that I think it leads to some confusion. Um, that, would, that would eliminate a lot of that um, as well as those, those crossings are tremendously long right now, especially if people are trying to get to, to stewards and you have all that excessive, excessive pavement. So, by pulling that curb line out to the, the existing shoulder line almost um, dramatically shortens those uh, shortens those crossings. I think we have a, a blow up of what we're proposing to do. Um, 
we believe that in the future, as this piece gets studied further, working with DOT, that um, having uh, a stop in both direction was something I know that the committee um, expressed that, that that would be ideal. Um, I think DOT, just that, that part they would have to work through, we, we believe that that would be the right thing uh, to do as well, to really force people to, to stop you know, the, the geometry of Maiden Lane also coming into the picture, create, create some, again, some integrity <coughs> of who has the right of way. Um, but we think tightening all this up will uh, help alleviate some of that as well. Um, as it turns uh, to, to the south and, and southeast uh, and Main Street extends, um, we also want to continue that trend similar to what we're doing on North Main Street. That same thing <coughs> happens uh, essentially all the way down to the bridge where that, uh, it, it's excessively paved. So without um, still leaving room for on-street parking, but being able to uh, take back some of that pavement again, get those street trees back in there to help slow people down and increase the aesthetic value. Um, also in places like Stewart's, you know, that whole area doesn't necessarily have to be paved wall to wall. If we could make sure they have plenty of wide access points, but does the whole, you know, couple hundred feet of pavement, is that necessary there? Um, because that becomes a really big gap for someone using that sidewalk of having to kind of negotiate that when someone can pull in at any point along that stretch. If you, if you make their access points limited, then everyone is on the same page. Drivers know where they're pulling in and pedestrians can anticipate where they're going to be. And again, the photo on the left just kind of demonstrates the existing condition, and then the, the little sketch on the right just demonstrates by, by taking back some of that excess of pavement how much we can shorten uh, that, that crossing um, and kind of enhance the aesthetic quality of that intersection. And then uh, the next area, we're calling it kind of the, the Hamlet Hub or the Mixed Use Hub. Uh, just on uh, the other side of the, the bridge there. Um, as I mentioned before, this is, let's see if, there we go. I'm gonna hop back. Um, so as Adele was alluding to and, and Monica, um, you have a tremendous amount of street connectivity, sidewalk connectivity, and rooftops within a five minute walk of this center hub. And in the design and planning world with Hamlet revitalization, that is a critical factor. That five minute means that's what people are willing to do on a day-to-day -day basis in their life. So most Hamlets would give anything to have what you have. You add the fact that your school is within that same walking distance, that's really a home run. That's a tremendous quality of life thing that you can market and sell. The piece that's missing, really the only piece that's missing in your hamlet is a nice charming little hamlet center. You've got Bear Swamp Road and kind of typical commercial auto oriented stuff, but you don't have anything that's capturing and taking advantage of all those rooftops that are within walking distance to what could be a very small, appropriately scaled center that kind of demonstrates the quality and identity of your community. And we think that you have uh, kind of the framework to, to build on that in the future. So let me go back one. So again, we're, we're talking about the area of the existing hardware store, and then on the other side of the streets, those clusters of three buildings. Um, there's a fabric there um, that I think is perfectly scaled. A lot of times, hamlets like yours may have had a heyday where the infrastructure of their downtown expanded to a point that whatever time, whenever that industry that led to that heyday declined, you're left with all of that infrastructure to maintain. And so it's very hard to revitalize when it gets strung out too far because these types of things are meant to be clustered together, the feed off of one another. So you got out of your car once, 
and you might be going to the bakery, but the coffee shop's right there, or a sandwich shop, or the antique store, whatever it might be, catches your eye on your way. And, and so they're all intended to function together completely differently than it's intended to function on Bear Swamp Road. Um, so again, that's why it's so critical that we take advantage of that sidewalk connectivity and walkability from uh, your neighborhoods. So what should a Hamlet Center be? Well, it should be architecturally attractive. Um, again, this is a place that is intended to bring the community together. This is the place that when folks come out of town, this is what's going to identify you. This is the, the heart of your community, who, who you are. Um, again, it's got to be pedestrian friendly. That's the nature of that level of commercialism versus what's happening on Bear Swamp Road. And the businesses you know, should be thriving. That, that's the goal. Opportunities, again, to bring the community together, um, to get out of your car and, and uh, hit multiple things in one stop. Or as you're going, walking to the park to be able to grab a coffee, taking your kid to the playground, walking to the trail, all of those things, take advantage of that and ultimately a place that you're proud of. So, simply all we did in that, and again in that little stretch was just give it some definition. Add some curbing, some on-street parking, some more generous sidewalk zones, um, potential for parking in the rear, because the idea is we're going to make this park extra special and it's going to need more parking than just what's available on the street even though there's plenty of on-street parking that as you as you go north um, but being able to cluster and share some of the parking behind buildings um, it's in the benefit of those we know that those units potentially have could, could have residential above um, but they're sharing that parking during different times of the day um, in this particular sketch, again, it's a longer term, um, but we've shown even as the market drives it, the opportunity for future info um, on that key corner. Uh, you know, that, that's probably the most predominant corner um, in the Hamlet core, so if ever the market got to a point where you could support new development, that would be a, a, a logical location. It doesn't have to happen. That, everything could happen without that um, but it's important with these kind of things these longer term ideas to understand that, that things change over time um, folks will, might be ready to sell or retire and all of a sudden that becomes an opportunity site um, so keeping your eye on the bigger picture the greater good of what the community needs um, in my professional opinion that's what your community is really missing it's kind of that they're there of who Peru is, you have so many other really tremendous assets, but you're missing that nice little walkable center that to me would kind of complete the, the package of a really marketable quality community. Um, but what can we do in the short term that can help some things? Right now, um, the sidewalk system ends just to the north of that hub. And so there's a gap between, uh, particularly on the east side, um, between there and the park and there and the trail and these existing businesses, it just stops. So, um, you know, as many of you probably know, that pavement uh, in there is, it's really not wide enough to have efficient parking. Um, and there's some, some old islands um, that are, uh, you know, paved islands that are in there that kind of force you to kind of jockey around, um, which is both unsafe because we've seen people, you know, have to back out into the road in odd ways. It's really confusing where you're supposed to enter. And again, it's a big pedestrian gap trying to get to the park or the trail or even to these businesses. <coughs> The reason why that island was there is at some point there was a guy wire to that utility pole right over here. And at some point the guy wire went away, but the island's there kind of wreaking havoc on how that whole pavement functions. So 
Something simple would be just to lop off that island because it's no longer functioning the way it did. And um, we could get that sidewalk connecting all through that, that zone there, um, which would make a much better uh, connection to the park and to the trail, even all the way to across the bridge to Tops. So we're kind of upside down here, but just to demonstrate the here's the Little All Sable Park, the bridge, there's the hub area we're talking about. The sidewalk ends right here, and the trail you know runs along the river under the bridge. Um, getting an accessible route down to the trail through the park is pretty pretty tough um, and potentially costly. We think that there's an opportunity on this side. There's an existing retaining wall that's kind of hidden in the vegetation there. And I think you could utilize that really simply to sneak the trail right from this green space right down and connect to it um, in a pretty low cost way. You probably could even do it in kind. Um, that could go towards match on future projects potentially. But um, that would again be a great way to create a loop within your trail system that brings you right to this hub and you know lead to future spin-off economics. The other area within this zone that we wanted to focus on was the intersection of Pleasant and Elm. Uh, right now there's a lot of ambiguity there where those two roads fork and come back to Maine. Um, and we think there's a pretty straightforward uh, solution. We think that Pleasant should be kind of the primary uh, road there. And simply by uh, pulling this curb line and making Elm tie into Pleasant in a more perpendicular way um, can give us a nicer entry into the park um, by creating this buffer. It gives the priority back to from a hierarchy standpoint, back to Pleasant. So it makes that whole intersection much more straightforward and, uh, and easy to understand, both for drivers and pedestrians, um, as well as, you know, in combination with these, any future improvements in the hub, um, again, would shorten and clarify that crossing. The other thing that you'll notice as part of uh, this sketch is that we're talking about putting sidewalks on both sides of the bridge. Right now you just have the sidewalk on one, um, and there's plenty enough room on the shoulder. Um, and we had some preliminary discussions with DOT about thinking could it handle the weight of pulling, you know, adding a curb on the other side and sidewalk zone. And we think that that's a a feasible thing to pursue in the, in the future, um, which I think would, again, help the connectivity into your hub, but also to one of your other economic assets in your grocery store. So again, on this side, if, uh, you know, if we take back a little bit of the shoulder on each side and balance it out. Not only will it slow the traffic down on the bridge, but it'll provide the opportunity um, to have pedestrian connections on both sides. As Monica said, you know, in every community we work in, one of the things that you want to do is look at what you have. We have this tremendous asset in the river. It's it's beautiful, but right now you just have a highway going over it. Um, looking at how, how you can turn like a physical element of something that you have into uh, a, 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 an asset that contributes to who you are um, and plays that role of a gateway um, is again that that's kind of low hanging fruit of something that you could do to enhance something that you already have. And again it's simple things like just hanging flower baskets or signage, putting some architectural columns um, on each end that can have lighting. Again, you can go as crazy as you'd want to go, but it's an opportunity that's kind of just sitting there. Um, so you could make it both functional, um, so kind of lead to the overall quality that, that lines up with the quality of the 
commitment that you already have throughout the community. Um, Monica talked about the sidewalk connection from, from Boulder. Um, this neighborhood, uh, again, we've got all those rooftops, but the, the kind of the northern piece of it is, a, is missing a little bit of the opportunity to kind of link back to, to Main Street um, in a safe way. So down the road, um, sidewalk uh, extensions in that neighborhood uh, would be helpful and recommended. Um, and then, again, the, the, this is, uh, I think, getting towards the intersection of, uh, at Fair Swamp Road, getting back. Um, already seeing some reinvestment <coughs> um, from the last time I was here, which is great. Um, but as you kind of move down from Pasquale's on both sides there, um, you're, again, it's getting overpaced and you kind of lose, even though there might be sidewalks in place, you lose uh, that walkability because you're kind of right next to that high-speed traffic. So looking for any opportunity you can to take back some of that pavement, get some defensible space between you and, and moving steel is something that is, is a simple, fairly low-cost uh, thing to do that will slow traffic down make your community more walkable and make it look a lot nicer. And we talked about the priority project um, for North Main Street. Um, once we end, I, can, I think I'll be able to handle a lot more with maybe with some of your questions for, for that piece. You better wrap it up for a minute. Yeah, we'll have to talk <laughs> All right, and then that's really, that's really the uh, the, the end of it there. Um, again, we've got the priority project teed up to go out to bid um, whenever you're ready for that. Um, and then the other projects would you know, need to go through more permitting and design pieces to get ready for construction. Is there any questions right now? The first part that you want to go out and get for would be which part? The, uh, the, north, uh, the north Main Street piece out here. That is basically from the Dollar the General all the way to the intersection. Center or at the Dollar General? Right? Well, that would be the entire project. It would be the whole thing from there, both sides of the street. So do you think 120000 will do the whole thing? Yeah, we think we, we, that, we think that you'll actually can probably get, I would get bet the bids are going to come in a little under that. It's really, I mean, it's it's literally just saw cutting, removal of the pavement, adding some topsoil. So primarily when you're saw cutting, um, how many feet out are you thinking? Three feet, four foot? Uh, it probably averages between four and eight. And the, the trees, the lower ones? They was type, I don't know the name. Sure. The roots go deeper into the ground so that they don't pop back up and push up on the tarmac. Right, yeah, I mean, we, we can, uh, the, the, the trees that we would be recommending both would be salt tolerant. We know, we know they're going to end up with a, a, a lot of snow on them. Um, and they're, they're typical street trees that are, you know, on the DOT approval list, um, that I think would be uh, appropriate for the, the smaller ones that are under wires and then the ones where that are under wires that would get a little bigger. And then the placement of the trees were under consideration as to the driveways for people that have to pull out so that it's not blocking so that if they're backing out in the traffic? Sure, I mean, with, with the, those uh, kind of things, I mean, right now we kind of ha have so, uh, a, a, a rhythm on there, but we'd be happy to look at, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that we can make on site at, um, adjustments to yes, in the future. One thing on the trees. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, what you have to keep in mind is, is there is the there is an existing on street parking zone, so you you know you can have about eight feet um, of extra distance that the person exiting their driveway can pull out to get a better sight line that should get them beyond 
the line of the street trees. Just first year, you got to water these trees. Uh, that's going to be town's responsibility, or something. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we we've been talking about that potentially um, with the in the spec we could require um, that the contractor um, provide watering for that year. I mean, they're going to be having to guarantee them for that year uh, anyway. Yeah. So we could write a more stringent performance spec that during that establishment period that you're referring to, we could make that a requirement as part of the project. And if it if it was something that the town didn't want to take on that burden. So that's something to consider uh, how we would want to work. We could make it so that, you know, once we've gotten through the punch list and the contractor is kind of done, that the town takes over that responsibility, but we could also build it into the bay. Um, with the ins and outs of tree lines and all of that, that's also going to have to line up with your manhole covers as they currently exist. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's very few, there's very little existing uh, structures out there, and we, in working with DOT back and forth, um, we've maintained all of those existing things. So, predominantly, what's happening now is it's a paved swell through that excess parking. That, that excess paved area is basically a paved swell, so the water stormwater is making a beeline to the outfall area, which is on the other side of the street. Um, this is going to slow that down a lot. The grass is going to let it naturally infiltrate. It'll it'll slow it down some, but we're not we're not uh, impacting any of the existing stormwater infrastructure. Uh, one last question. We removed the uh, last time we talked about the granite curbing. Uh, That's gone. That is gone. That is off that. There was a misunderstanding about the grant. The, the, it's not raised. It's not, I asked that tonight because that cheap. was a big thing because being yeah. raised, I talked to Mike Farrell about it. And, you know, he said the first time the files go through. Yeah. I talked to Ian tonight. That is flush. The sidewalks in this area are are sitting, the existing sidewalks are sitting pretty low, almost even with the adjacent pavement. Um, so we don't have the ability to elevate the curb there anyway, because then we'd be ponding water on the sidewalk, so we wouldn't want to do that either. So for the most part, all those areas, that's it's all going to be a flush connection where we have those two areas up here in front of Town Hall and in the library where we've just kind of doubled the width of the sidewalk in that zone and kind of in those drop-off areas. Um, and just did a flush granite curve just to be a more durable material between the, the pavement and the sidewalk. Um, to give that sidewalk something more durable to, to run up against. Itself. Yep. And we, you know, we, we do streetscape projects all over upstate and, and have found that um, I mean, plows beat up everything, but the granite will hold up better than a concrete curve will. Um, so even if it were raised, I still think granite would be the right choice. But in this case, it will be flush, so it, it will take much less of less of a beating. Uh, when we talked last time, we removed that granite as part of the pricing on that. Yes, so we'll be pricing that. Yeah, we did, and we also talked about straight cuts. Yeah, it's 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 instead of the, the radius cuts, cuts into the driveway, just, cuts, just uh, chamfer the cuts. Yep. Because yeah. that was the question that I had to the straight cut. And as far as, like Jim said, the size of the trees, uh, DOT, they work with you. I mean, you certainly don't want big trees like that, uh, you know, coming out of uh, driveways and stuff. Yeah, I mean, when it's going to be a long time before they yeah. before they get to, to that point. But you know what I would say that's counter to that is ultimately, you know, and this this is age old Main Street USA, you know, those big trees again that they are they do create a little bit of a visual barrier, but that's what's making the driver slow down because they don't think that they can see the whole world forces them to slow down. It's just like when you go through a dense downtown area and you've got both street trees and uh, decorative lighting, all kinds of vertical elements that 
providing visual screening to everything, but that's why uh, in those areas you want it to be really tight because it really forces the drivers to slow down and be more mindful of their surroundings. And if we need another workshop and another, you know, before a meeting, we can have another one, you know, later on. If there's more questions, or more concerns, or something like that, too. Um, maybe we can just put this on the agenda for some subsequent meeting and the board can discuss whatever question other. Thank you. Organize.